Okay, so now we move on to Joshua Morano, um, who will be speaking on oh, okay. risk, salvage, and exploring the concept of the maritime frontier. And uh, Joshua is a maritime archaeologist who has been working at Biscayne National Park since November 2012. He's a graduate from East Carolina University's program in maritime studies and has earned an MA degree in maritime history and nautical archaeology, where his research focused on the application of social theory to maritime archaeology. He has previously been employed as an archaeological technician for the state of North Carolina and has participated in several major maritime archaeological projects. In addition to his interest in archaeology, Mr. Morano is an active member of the United States Coast Guard Reserve. Welcome. Just a quick note for you guys uh, who don't know me personally, I'm getting married in three weeks, so uh, my brain's a little bit of a scatter, so unfortunately you guys are going to have to deal with it in that. You're going to have to listen to me read a paper, so my apologies. For centuries, the rocky shorelines of the Florida Keys were often littered with the sighted of bloated corpses, splintered masts, and jettisoned cargo brutally cast ashore after meeting their fate on the treacherous reefs lying just offshore. While foundering upon the high seas often meant imminent death, the prospect of wrecking upon the shore off often held little hope for any assistance. Since vessels first explored the area, the approximate route of the Gulf Stream between the Florida Keys and Bahamas, often simply referred to as the Straits, have been identified as a dangerous area. The unpredictable nature of the Gulf Stream, combined with the limited knowledge of the area, culminated in a disastrous combination as the reefs along the southeastern coastline of Florida became the final resting place for hundreds of vessels. As such, the rocky reefs and isolated islets of the Florida Keys exemplify the risk associated when navigating near a desolate and dangerous shoreline. One of the primary goals of maritime archaeology is to identify convincing linkages between the physical associations represented by shipwrecks and the social institutions that help create them. While not necessarily a new concept, the effective application of maritime cultural landscapes approach in the management of submerged cultural heritage within the United States has been difficult. This is particularly true in regards to the effect of identification, documentation, and analysis of maritime cultural landscapes through pre-existing manage management doctrines such as the National Historic Landmark Program and National Register of Historic Places. While otherwise ubiquitous institutions within the cultural resource management practices of the United States, the terminology, theory, and approaches utilized in the study of maritime cultural landscapes does not currently exist in either of these or any other research management regimes utilized today. As such, the theoretical foundations of this work will utilize maritime cultural landscapes approach developed and successfully tested in Australia that have only recently been introduced to the United States. These approaches acknowledge the difficulties in conducting the systematic and scientific study of less tangible ideals associated with human agency and cognition in a variety of applications. Utilizing the methodologies advanced in these approaches, this work will identify several contexts that begin to shed light on local and regional differences in the perceptions and responses to risk in the maritime environment. This approach can provide invaluable insight into the cultural values of a local community that would not otherwise be apparent through more traditional historic, ethnographic, or archaeological research efforts. As such, this study will attempt to analyze and explain the development of what would be called a maritime salvage landscape through the application of sociocultural theories to highlight cultural motivators contributing to this landscape. While the development of maritime salvage throughout the Florida Keys represents only a, one of a number of factors contributing to the area's overall cultural landscape, studying the establishment and subsequent evolution of wrecking and salvage practices thematically can shed light on patterns significantly contributing to both the area's physical and cultural landscapes. Establishing this connection not only helps resource managers locate, identify, and interpret thematically related cultural sites, but by understanding cultural factors contributing to their disposition, value, and use over time, the application of these theoretical paradigms can help explain contemporary perceptions of similar resources. While many wrecks undoubtedly occurred offshore, the vast majority occurred within sight of land only a few miles from the beach. Those unfortunate enough to survive the initial wrecking event were cast onto an isolated, lawless, and mosquito-infested island, many of which lacked access to fresh water. While occasionally uninhabited, many of these islands were home to native populations, that were often hostile toward the poor souls seeking refuge after wrecking on the perilous reefs. Survivors of wrecks were often captured, enslaved, or killed upon discovery by local natives. Tales of torture, abuse, and violence permeated many of the survivors' accounts. The same could be said about the city of Miami today. Possibly due to the indistinguishable physical characteristics of the islands or the fear of the natives who resided there, historical accounts emphasizing the physical characteristics of the ter terrestrial landscape of the Florida Keys are lacking. 
While detailed historical descriptions of the islands forming the Florida Keys are scarce, most sources denoting the locations for obtaining fresh water, safe harbor, and obvious dangers are vaguely described and are apparent in the region's, region's toponymy. As the area was further developed, major settlements, Key West, Indian Key, fortifications at the Dry Tortugas and Key West, and shore-based aids to navigation all contributed to the maritime cultural landscape. Their importance, however, was secondary to that, to the shallow reefs lying just beneath the water's surface. While it could be argued that the presence of more prominent, tangible, physical features, more traditionally considered landscape characteristics, ended at the water's edge, mariners trained by millennia of tradition actively maintained watch for physical indicators of the shallow flats, jagged patch reefs, and the wrecks of less fortunate vessels that dangerously lurk just beneath the surface as menacing threats to those unfamiliar with the minute details of the area's unique bathymetry. While early sailing directions advocated avoidance of dangers, the dangerous area, the early need for detailed survey of the Florida Reef, as well as the establishment of a series of lighthouses, buoys, and beacons to identify and avoid the reefs are well documented in the historic record. As knowledge of the area grew, sailing directions cautiously advised mariners to be on a constant lookout for breaking surf, contrary currents, changes in water color indicating a rapid change in depth or bottom composition, aids to navigation, and any other physical indicators of potential threats to their voyage. The ability to identify, analyze, and mitigate the dangers of navigating in an area considered, are considered a staple of good seamanship and remain a vital skill in navigating the treasures near shore waterways of the Florida Keys. While the tiny islets briefly ma uh, mentioned in early sailing instructions have now been developed beyond recognition, the shoals, rocks, and reefs that form the Florida Reef Track have not appreciably changed throughout the historic period and remain similar to those encountered by mariners throughout antiquity. As such, the study of the discovery, documentation, utilization, and avoidance of many of the unique physical characteristics that remain prominent features in the landscape embody both the historical and contemporary difficulties in utilizing the area and therefore provide an insight into an element of unique cognitive landscapes of the area. This insight is vital in developing an understanding of the complex role of the exploration, documentation, utilization of the region's unique landscape it plays in the uh, cur cultural ideals emphasized in the identification and mitigation of risk in the marine environment. Introduction to Maritime Salvage in the Florida Keys. For those in peril along the coast of the Florida Keys, the icy grip of death often consumed sailors a little hope of rescue. Prior to the establishment of systematic salvage system, their only chance of surviving a wreck or disaster lay with the solemn duty of his fellow seafarers to provide assistance. As was often the case, the isolation of the Florida Keys combined with the early lack of vessel traffic often left little hope of discovery or rescue and nearly ensured shipwrecked mariners along the coast were doomed to their fates. The loss of life in both raw and manufactured material on what was considered the edge of modern world led to the development of an informal salvage network first amongst local native inhabitants and subsequently followed by more formal attempts by the maritime empire sustaining the losses in members of their colonial communities. While not initially meant to serve as a means to reduce risk of navigating near the reef, the abundance and constant presence of opportunistic Bahamian wreckers found cruising the Florida Reef soon became so ubiquitous that wrecked mariners began to depend upon their presence and agonizingly prayed for their speedy arrival in the event of disaster. Their exploits, both negative and positive, were often recounted as the only means of survival in an otherwise perilous situation. The reputation of wreckers and the informal salvage network they created developed the preliminary foundations of a cognitive landscape in which help in the event of disaster was available and as such was considered when discussing the risk of operating the Florida Keys. While this activity aided in establishing a foundation of, con of a cognitive landscape of risk in the Florida Keys, it was not until the annexation of the state by the United States did this development begin in earnest. Spurred by economic development and drastic increases in shipping traffic and the prevalence of illegal activity throughout the region, led to the establishment of a port of entry in Key West in 1822 and the development of a salvage system unique to the area and heavily influenced by the area's physical landscape. The subsequent survey, documentation, and subsequent establishment of an aid to navigation system in the area by the United States Coast Survey provided some of the first detailed maps of the area and reflected attempts to modify and utilize the area's phys unique physical landscape. These systems were in a state of constant development throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, during which time more than 640 vessels came to grief upon the Florida reefs, the peak of which was observed during the 19, 1850s, when vessels piled up on the coast at a rate of one per week. After the turn of the century, advances in shipboard technology, the introduction and utilization of steam, and the continual advancement of survey operations greatly reduced the number of vessels wrecking along the reef. The settlement and development of large portions of the Florida Keys brought unprecedented amounts of people and goods into the area, reducing the need for salvage of mundane goods now more easily attainable through other means on shore. As such, the focus in maritime salvage narrowed to include only valuable, desirable, or illicit goods. This preferential treatment was particularly meaningful as it represents one of the first major shifts how local mariners perceived and reacted to risk in the maritime domain. Focus moved from the systematic salvage of all vessels in peril on the Florida Reef only to those that the salvage of which stood to provide a considerable financial gain. 
Despite this perceived lack of interest, advancing technologies soon offer new opportunities to exploit shipwrecks along the Florida Reef for financial gain. Coinciding with the advent of recreational scuba gear following the Second World War, the concept of salvage in the Florida Keys would be resurrected and reinvented, this time focusing on the recovery of valuable cargoes from historic shipwrecks. Fortunately, the methods utilized by those seeking historic salvage of shipwrecks for the sole purpose of capitalizing upon their economic value of their former cargoes were particularly detrimental to both the historic fabric of the shipwrecks themselves and to the natural environment around them, both of which are increasingly considered sensitive resources worthy of protection. The imminent rapid development of the area, combined with the systematic destruction of the area's submerged cultural resources and the insatiable search for lost treasures, threaten local total destruction of the area's unique natural environment and, one, and once extensive collection of finite cultural resources. Its realization coincided with the development and advancement of a, per, of a period of political, environmental, and social awareness known as the conservation movement. Success of the conservation movement, the creation of new legislation specifically protecting archaeological sites, and the subsequent establishment of protected marine zones throughout the Florida Keys significantly curbed development of the area and included the end of commercial salvage in an attempt to ensure its pre, uh, resources, conservation, and protection for future generations. While instituting in good faith, each proposed change was met with considerable resistance from those seeking to develop the area in order to capitalize on the region's natural and cultural resources. This discourse represents the current management issues throughout the region as the integrity of finite archaeological resources, while legally protected throughout the vast majority of the study area, are continually under threat due to persistent cultural attraction and maritime salvage in the area. Given the breadth of human activity occurring in the area associated with the discovery, exploration, and utilization of the Florida Straits and its importance to the local, regional, and global scales, the area holds significant potential for future study. Unfortunately, many attempts to study archaeological remains in the area focus solely on individual wreck sites suffering from recent damage from a variety of natural and human factors or simply site-specific documentation surveys. Attempts to examine multiple sites in the area have culminated in a series of regional inventories but have not yet ventured to tie any unifying thematic elements to expand our knowledge of the local cultural elements. Another challenge in the successful application of maritime cultural landscape approaches in South Florida resource management stems from a lack of clearly defined sets of term te terminology, standards, and methodologies to effectively identify, evaluate, and recognize maritime cultural landscapes utilizing established means currently in use. This deficiency is due to a combination to the perceived differences in theoretical approaches to the study of submerged cultural heritage, reliance upon particularistic approaches focusing solely on shipwrecks of submerged cultural heritage, place-based management strategies, and a misunderstanding of the relationships between seafaring people and the natural environment. Nowhere can this phenomenon be more plainly seen than in the attempt to identify maritime cultural landscapes using standards and guidelines established through one of two programs administered by the NPS, National Register or the National Historic Landmark Program. As such, this study will utilize theoretical approaches that have been successfully utilized to identify, delineate, and interpret maritime cultural landscapes in Australia. Specifically, the study will analyze the role of risk and the development of a maritime frontier in the development of maritime cultural landscape focused on the salvage industry. Where Ford argues that while geographics, geographical studies tend to focus on the questions of where and archaeological or historical projects tend to focus on the when or how, a new approach pioneer in Australia hopes to address why. In their 2015 work, God Please Send a Wreck, response to the 19th century Australian shipwreck community, Brad Duncan and Martin Gibbs examined the role of risk, disaster the response, and shipping mishaps in the development of a maritime cultural landscape in the vicinity of Queenscliff, Australia. Duncan and Gibbs works build on earlier studies that focus on the application of various ethno-archaeological approaches to pre-existing archaeological data sets to explain human behavior not otherwise apparent through traditional analysis. While many of these studies examine a particular geographic locale, analytical focus is not necessarily restricted as focus remains fixated on the cultural factors contributing to site formation processes. The goal of much of this work is to successfully apply sociocultural theories to pre-existing data sets in order to identify, investigate, and interpret certain elements of the maritime cultural landscape. This specific focus acknowledges the vast nature of maritime cultural landscapes and that it is argued here are too complex to be effectively identified through the course of a single research effort. It's particularly true given the fact that maritime cultural landscapes are modified and utilized through human agency. Many of the modifications are indicative of social systems that are dynamic and subject to constant change. So the three things that we try to look at in, in the development of this cultural landscape is basically risk, salvage, and then uh, the frontier. The most risk is simply identified as a potential for negative and undesirable outcome that is usually synonymous with terms danger or hazard. For the purpose of this study, however, a better definition of risk may be the systematic way of dealing with hazards and insecurities introduced 
uh, induced and introduced by modernity itself. Beck's definition provides a more insightful definition of the term that explains the actual purpose of risk in society, whereas the concept of risk may be most familiar only as a factor in personal decision making. As such, it can be much more influential in larger systems throughout society, the remnants of which may be present as tangible components of the archaeological landscape. It is argued that, while not the only factor involved, risk and the responses to it play a major role in defining the use of cultural landscapes. For the purposes of this study, it is argued that, and more specifically, the mitigation of risk in the maritime environment could be considered a near universal trait observable throughout human ex experience, existence. In order to objectify and identify and measure what could otherwise be described as a feeling or emotion, non-traditional research strategies required, and several recent studies conducted have developed methodologies to examine the behavioral responses to risk in the development of the maritime cultural landscape. The concept of risk is to be considered a universal uh, with a cultural theme within maritime societies. One may question how to systematically and scientifically approach such a cognitive subject and what would be gained from its study. While the concept of risk may be present, local and regional variations in how societies perceive and manage risk provide vital insight into social structures, values, and the development and modification of both cognitive and physical landscapes within the local community. As such, the study of the identification, mitigation, and management of risk within the maritime communities holds considerable potential for future study. It's often been argued for as long as vessels have plied the world's waterways, there has been the risk of wreck or disaster, the occurrence of which would be, should be seen as a mere eventuality. The saving of property from said disaster, the concept of maritime salvage, is therefore potentially as old as the first vessels to venture from the relative safety of their moorings. Salvage has been identified as the rendering of assistance to vessels and their cargo in distress at sea. In his seminal work on the subject, late Keith Muckleroy describes the role of historic salvage played, but generally refers to it as uh, environmental in nature. While Muckleroy's work is often considered to be one of the first attempts to develop and apply middle-range theory, it has been critiqued in that while he did acknowledge both natural and cultural factors in the formation of submerged archaeological sites, his research primarily focused on environmental processes associated with site formation. Recent studies have sought to identify cultural and behavioral elements contributing to both the wrecking of vessels, vessel reuse and abandonment, as well as their effects on salvage and subsequent archaeological site formation processes. Variations in cultural values, perceived risks, societal structures, and the physical characteristics of the landscape can result in significant variations in the human response to risk and the dangers specific to a particular locale. In regards to frontier, while the study of the development of maritime salvage in the Florida Keys may provide insight into how the local community worked to mitigate risk during the maritime activities and mishaps, it's not necessarily answer why such efforts were expended. While the obvious underlying theme, particularly in its early stages, is economic in nature, it could be also be argued that the extreme isolation, danger, and ruggedness of the area forced those utilizing the area to develop a survival mentality similar to that developed and romanticized on the plains of the frontier of the American West. A concept known as Frontier Thesis was presented in a paper entitled The Significance of Frontier in American History by historian Frederick Jackson Turner at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. In his paper, Turner argues that the settlement of the American frontier was formative to the development of American ideals and were particularly influential in the development of the country's political, social, cultural ideals. Turner specifically argues that the availability of free land and the process of developing the frontier created a unique set of cultural ideals that was the base for American democracy. Turner, Turner eloquently argues that the, that the frontier is the meeting point between savagery and civilization. Many of Turner's ideas have been justly criticized as being overly nationalistic and discounting the roles of women, minorities, and native populations in the development of the American West. Researchers have also applied Turner's model in the identification of comparative frontiers across the globe. It is argued here that the core of his frontier theory, particularly the idea that the development of the frontier was formative to the development of unique cultural ideas, is just as applicable to the study of maritime frontier as the vast expanses of the Great Plains. For those navigating in the vicinity of dangerous, isolated, and poorly documented shorelines, the idea of the maritime frontier aptly describes a dangerous and often lawless environment where help and hope in the event of disaster are just out of reach. As such is argued, while Turner's theories as a whole are limited by the social and political climate from which they were developed, the underlying cultural theme and so um, play my last cultural theme attributed to the frontier as discussed by Turner can be identified as a cultural motivator in the development of unique maritime cultural landscape in the Florida Keys. While the identification and mitigation of risks, the development of maritime salvage and the perception of value of submerged cultural heritage vary as the focus, nature, and extent of salvage changes over time. The identification of underlying unifying cultural motivators help explain regional variations and evolution of salvage activity throughout history. While Westerall established the theoretical basis for the identification and study of maritime cultural landscapes, its effective application in resource management has remained elusive. It is argued here that many of the difficulties in identifying and defining maritime cultural landscapes primarily stems from the broad interpretation of its individual components and the focus on geophysical rather than cultural components of the landscape. 
While there has been great enthusiasm for the idea of maritime cultural landscapes, many of the recent attempts to identify them in the United States tend to be geographically oriented and focus wholly on either the geophysical components of the landscape or the historical use of a particular place. Many of these studies produce works which are more resemble cultural resource inventories or at best regional archaeological studies in which primary unifying theme amongst all sites included are geophysical in nature with minimal examination of social or cultural factors influencing their deposition. As such, this work presents a reevaluation of the maritime cultural landscape approach in which advocates for the broad generalist and multidisciplinary analysis of maritime archaeological sites that can provide researchers with information that may otherwise be unobtainable through more traditional surveys, specifically the application of sociocultural theories to historical and archaeological data sets, the explicit establishment of both thematic and theoretical frameworks, focusing on ethnographic maritime cultural landscape studies is therefore vital in the development of a systematic and scientific approach and convincingly identify cultural themes within existing archaeological data sets.